This is George Taylor from Boston Children's Hospital. And today we're going to be talking about the imaging of pediatric chest trauma. This talk will focus on the epidemiology of chest injury in children, some of the indications for chest CT, a little bit about technique and the types of injury and their imaging findings. In terms of epidemiology, the Severe, severe chest injury or significant chest injury is seen much more commonly in boys and girls. It is almost always associated with rapid deceleration injuries, especially with motor vehicle accidents. Although isolated chest injury is uncommon, it is often associated with either abdominal or head and neck injury as well. Significant chest injury requiring therapy is seen in about 25% of all children with chest injury. And mild, in cases of mild to moderate severity, additional therapy is not required. And this is seen in about 30% of all children. Chest, significant chest injury is seen in about 4% of all trauma admissions. And the mechanisms of injury that are much that are the most common are pedestrian injuries hit by cars, passengers in a motor vehicle accident, or fall. Although abuse is less common, it is an important diagnosis to make and may be quite serious as well. The injuries that we typically see in the chest include pulmonary contusions, the most common, pneumo or hemothorax, and rib fractures, as well as multi-system injury. So one of the things that makes the pediatric chest different than adults is that the chest wall is much more compliant. As a result, it's a poor protector of the lung and upper abdominal organs. And so because rib fractures are less common in children than in adults, a flail chest is much less common. The other feature of children is that they tend to swallow air resulting in gastric distension and often in respiratory compromise. So placement of a nasogastric tube is a frequent intervention in children with abdominal chest trauma. The chest size is proportionately small in children and so therefore there's a common association with other injuries. In addition, comma, there are few pre-existing conditions in children, so there's a much higher potential for recovery. Not every child needs a chest CT. The highest yield indications for chest CT include an opacified hemithorax, an unexplained physiologic shunt, a pulse oximetry with less than 85% saturation, the presence of multiple rib fractures as an indicator of the degree of force that was applied to the chest, the presence of an unexplained pneumothorax on an abdominal CT, and finally mediastinal widening in a stable patient as a sign of potential vascular injury. The impact on management of CT is very high in very selected patients. In a study of over 200 consecutive patients who had a CT after chest injury, the um, CT was abnormal in over 60%, while the chest x-ray obtained very at or near the time was only abnormal in less than 40%. However, interventions that were indicated as the result of a CT scan were relatively uncommon only being required in less than 5% of patients. And only less than 1% of pneumothoraces were seen only on chest, X, on chest CT, so they were very small and not, did not require additional therapy. All of this points to the fact that a routine chest CT is not indicated in children unless there is a specific indication and specific concern. The scanning technique is uh, important, but a preliminary AP chest radiograph is absolutely essential to guide us to looking for specific abnormalities.
We scan from the lower neck to the upper abdomen after intravenous contrast enhancement. And the timing is um, during the mixed arterial and venous phase. Our pre-contrast arterial and venous phase studies are simply not indicated in childhood. Well, let's start talking about some of the abnormalities that we can see. One of the common things that we'll see is a pulmonary contusion. The pathophysiology underlying contusions is that of hemorrhage. There's a primary hemorrhage, and there's often spillover of hemorrhage as the blood escapes the area of contused lung into the bronchus and then spills into more dependent parts of the lung. There is also increased capillary, capillary permeability, decreased pulmonary compliance, and intrapulmonary shunting as well. And although the chest x-ray may appear to be entirely normal, these findings may progress over the first one to two days. The contusions are often seen when the lung is trapped and compressed between hard structures such as the ribs and the spine. In this child who had a, was involved in a motor vehicle accident and was hit from the right side, we can see two triangular contusions in the periphery of the right lung where, and separated by a, an area of normal lung. A more detailed look at that area shows that there is a little bit of peripheral sparing in these, which is a classic for these um, pediatric contusions. These are called kissing contusions because two parts of the lung are forced together and return back um, when the chest wall um, recoils. Now, contusions can often tell us uh, a lot about the the orientation of the the force of injury as well as some of the underlying mechanisms. Here is a, an adolescent who was wearing a, a, a seat belt restraint who was involved in a very high speed motor vehicle accident. And we can see that the contusion is primarily along the anterior aspect of both hemithoraces. This was as the result of an acute compression of the chest by the chest component of the, the seat belt. And we can see that it's sparing the rest of the lung. Here's another child who was hit by a hockey puck in the left anterior chest wall. And we can see that there is a hematoma of the pectoralis muscle. But what is striking is the degree of underlying focal lung contusion as the result of transmitted force. With blunt pulmonary trauma, there is often deformation of the lung and shear forces that make the lung move in different directions. As, the result, as a result, the lung gets fractured or torn, and then as the lung relaxes because of the elastic recoil, one gets the formation of a cavity that becomes filled with fluid and blood and then surrounding hemorrhage. This is seen on CT as a pneumatocele within an area of contusion or hemorrhage. And in this child, we can see that there is blood in the dependent portions of the lung as a result of spillover. These do not necessarily mean that this lung is injured. Here's another example of multiple pneumatoceles in the child who has been compressed in the anteroposterior dimension. We can see that both of these are adjacent to the, uh, the ribs and the, um, the vertebral body. We have here an example of a child who has a number of findings in the chest related to acute uh, chest injury. This 13-year-old boy was holding onto a car while going on a skateboard. The car turned suddenly and ran over the child. The preliminary scout radiograph of the CT shows an irregular alveolar density in the right upper lobe. Here we can see a peripheral um, 
area of airspace disease in the right lung and patchy areas of airspace disease in the left lung that follow the contour of the body. We can also see a rib fracture of the anterior right chest wall. In a lower cut, we can see that there is spillover blood that's uh, pooling in the dependent parts of the lung. This cleared very rapidly over the next 24 hours. We also see multiple um, pneumatoceles because of a, a torn lung and peripheral contusions in the contralateral lung. This is the child's chest um, from a clinical image of the chest showing the location of the tire track. This is a, a relatively uncommon case in that the child had a flail chest with multiple rib fractures. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, um, the issue of rib fractures in children later on. Here is a 14-year-old girl who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, but her injury was nowhere near the chest. And yet she has acute unexplained hypoxemia with these dense patchy peripheral areas of airspace disease in both lower lobes. Here is the large injury, the large uh, displaced fracture of her femur. And on CT, she had patchy dependent areas of alveolar opacity that don't represent blood in this case, but represent uh, capillary leakage and the ARDS syndrome. This is a result of fat embolism in acute respiratory distress. Here, a stain of her lung shows fat in the interstitium of the lung as a result of the fat embolism. So you can have significant pulmonary injury as the result of crush injury or uh, fat embolization. Here's another child that has partially compensated shock showing dilated loops of small bowel, vicarious extravasation of contrast through the gallbladder, and on chest CT she has a similar pattern of per uh, bilateral perihilar airspace disease and dependent edema as a manifestation of ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, secondary to poorly compensated shock. We see this rarely but it's an important cause of reversible hypoxemia in children. The next category of, of findings that I wanted to talk about was um, pneumothorax and hydrothorax. These are very obvious most of the time on plain film and on CT they can be much better characterized as to the extent of disease but CT is really not indicated just for the presence of a pneumothorax. On occasion we can see air dissecting in the periphery of the lungs but also involving major vital structures such as the pericardium. This is a, an adolescent who was run over by a truck and we can see a small heart size dilatation of the inferior vena cava as the result of a tension pneumopericardium. This child was a 12 year old ejected from a car during a high speed motor vehicle accident and we can see bilateral pneumothoraces, pneumomediastinum and subcutaneous emphysema. And the point of this case is to show you the patterns of extravasation and, um, and air dissection from the chest. Here in the middle mediastinum, we can see gas separating the thymus from the large vessels. We can see loculated pneumothoraces on both sides with gas being forced into the aortic hiatus and dissecting down into the retroperitoneum. More superiorly, we can see gas being dissected around the aorta and great vessels all the way up to the base of the neck. So the degree of ventilatory support also f tends to force air in all of these areas. Although CT is not necessary for the diagnosis of, of pneumothorax, sometimes it can be useful in identifying complications of a pneumothorax and uh, therapeutic failures, shall we say. 
Here is a child that had a right-sided pneumothorax and a chest tube was placed on the plain film. The chest tube looks like it's in perfectly good location. However, the chest tube continued to bubble with a persistent large pneumothorax. On CT, we see extensive contusion of the lung, but we also see the fact that the chest tube, although it looks like it's in good position on the chest x-ray, it is placed in the subcutaneous tissues and not intrathoracic. So it overlies the right chest wall, but it is not being effective. When we place chest tubes in children, the majority of them go into the pleural space. On occasion, they go into the pulmonary fissure, but rarely we have to see, we, we encounter a patient that has an intrapulmonary placement of a chest tube. This patient has a tube in the major fissure of the right lung. And if you'll notice, the difference between this chest tube and the chest tube in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, we can see that the second chest tube has adjacent peripheral atelectasis that completely surrounds or surrounds the tube to a great extent. This child, in addition to having a continuous pneumothorax, had this finding because of a puncture of the left lung. Here is a child that we've seen before with the flail chest, and we can see, again, um, a bit of pneumomediastinum. And as we go down, we see the loculated pneumothorax. And what I wanted to point out here is that that lung, the left lower lobe, is tethered by the, the chest tube as it enters the, the thoracic wall. This is a sign that the chest tube has impaled the lung as it enters the chest. And so this was an intraparenchymal chest tube. So the two signs to look for are peripheral atelectasis surrounding the chest tube and a tethering of the underlying lung by the chest tube. Now let's talk a little bit about tracheobronchial injuries in children. Fortunately, they're quite rare in children. In one study, only 16 cases were seen over a 26-year period in nine centers. The mechanism of injury is related to acute compression of the chest in an anteroposterior dimension with a closed glottis. And the common areas of tracheobronchial laceration include the neck, the carina, and central bronchi. The findings are extensive pneumoperitoneum, massive ongoing air leaks, and um, specifically an unrelenting pneumothorax. Here is a 17-year-old female who was involved as a passenger in a motor vehicle accident with persistent high-volume air leak. And we can see pneumomediastinum and a large left pneumothorax. On CT, we see extensive high-volume subcutaneous emphysema. And on a coronal reconstruction, the arrow shows the area of laceration just above the carina. On the axial images, we can see air dissecting around the trachea and the, the bronchi being compressed by hematoma. This child had a tracheal laceration that required um, surgery. Esophageal injuries are also uncommon in children and have the same type of mechanism of injury in terms of um, occurring with an AP compression while the patient has a closed glottis. The imaging goals are not only to identify the tear, but to distinguish a contained injury versus an open extensive injury. Contained injuries are focal tears and they can be treated with a nasogastric tube and antibiotics, while an open, larger injury resulting in hydropneumothorax or mediastinitis can, really requires open surgical repair. Here is a child who had an anteroposterior acute compression while being hit by a car, and we can see a nasogastric tube in the esophagus. There is periesophageal thickening and a focal 
air collection immediately adjacent to the esophagus that represented a focal tear in the esophagus. Let's turn our attention now to major vascular injuries in children. Again, these are rare in children, uh, accounting for less than half of a percent of all injuries in the chest in children. However, their mortality rate is quite high. It's almost exclusively associated with severe high um, vehicle, motor vehicle accidents and the failure to wear seat belts. The imaging signs of vascular injury in children are those very much the same ones that you would expect in adults, namely a wide superior mediastinum, an abnormal aortic contour, deviation of the trachea, etc. Here is a 12-year-old female who was an unrestrained back seat passenger in a motor vehicle accident. This supportable chest x-ray obtained in the emergency room shows widening of the mediastinum that was of concern, so a CT scan of the chest was performed. Here, a, an upper cut shows a mediastinal hematoma surrounding the aorta and superior vena cava. Lower down, we can see a focal defect in the descending aorta that is again seen on the coronal and sagittal reconstructions. She had additional injuries, including a splenic laceration and a, a cervical uh, jump facet. So this represented a focal tear of the aorta that was um, immediately addressed surgically. Here is the, the, the stent placed uh, to overlap that area of injury, and the child did well. Here's another child that um, was involved in a high-speed motor vehicle accident, this time as a belted passenger. And we again see a hematoma in the upper chest involving the um, great vessels and aortic arch. And here we see a, an intimal flap with a, um, a tear in the aorta. And the child also underwent stenting. Now, for the most part, the chest injuries in children are blunt uh, injuries. Every once in a while, uh, we will see a gunshot to, to um, the, the chest or a penetrating injury. And gunshots to the pediatric chest can, be, can result in overwhelming injury to the lungs. This was a four-year-old whose brother was playing with his father's gun and it went off going through a door and hitting his sister. And we can see that the path of the bullet went from behind through the spine into the left chest wall. Now, because this was a 38 caliber bullet, the extent of pulmonary contusion uh, was massive on not only on the ipsilateral side, but the contralateral side. The mass and the, the velocity of the bullet causes acute compression and then rarefaction of tissues, resulting in much more extensive injury than you can see, than you would expect with the, the path of the bullet. But this child also had a chest tube in place that had a um, ongoing bleeding. And we can see blood leaving the inferior left pulmonary artery and going directly to the chest tube in a child who had the, a um, laceration of the pulmonary vein. This was repaired and the child survived. Now, chest wall injuries can also be very important in children and don't receive very much attention in the imaging literature. Here we have a child who is hit by a hockey puck in the right neck. And you can see on this preliminary chest x-ray that there is some mild soft tissue swelling of the right side, the right supraclavicular area. The key finding in this child was that he had voice changes. He had a very high-pitched, hoarse, very difficult time in, with phonation, which can be a sign of vocal cord or laryngeal cartilage um, crush injury. So a CT was done showing that the trachea was a normal in caliber and that this hematoma was only located in the, the external soft tissues.
CT can also be very helpful in determining the position of a retropulsed clavicle. And this uh, reconstruction shows very nicely the posterior uh, extent of the, the right clavicle dislocation. However, it is very important to use intravenous contrast and see what the, the effect of this retropulsed clavicle is on the underlying vessels because if the vessel is compressed or it's okay to, to fix it, but if there's any concern for hematoma or laceration, a cardiothoracic sur surgeon should be involved in the surgery because as the clavicle is repositioned, it can lead to massive hemorrhage. Chest injury can also be seen in child abuse and rib fractures are common. However, lung and mediastinal injuries are relatively rare. The reported injuries that have been seen in uh, abused children have included a number of findings, including lung injury, tracheobronchial and esophageal injuries, as well as cardiovascular injuries. The key here is making the initial diagnosis so that the child can be placed in a safe environment. Here is a nine-month-old who fell from the bed, at least that was the history that was given, and to add more confusion to this, the mother was a pediatrician. So I point this out so that we, we're aware of the fact that child abuse happens at, in all cultures and in all walks of life. And here on the AP film, we can see one rib fracture uh, in the left mid chest. However, on the oblique views, we can see a number of left-sided rib fractures. These are um, very suspicious for uh, child abuse. And then on CT, on occasion, we will see a uh, healing rib fracture in the posterior aspect of, of the rib that um, is associated with a mechanism of acute chest compression. And these fractures are seen in three very characteristic places. Posteriorly, as the rib is reflected and pushed um, against the transverse process of the spine, at the apex of the curve of the rib laterally, and anteriorly as the rib inserts into the, into the sternum. So, the other thing I wanted to talk about since um, we had um, mentioned that rib fractures are relatively uncommon, it's very important to look for them because if we're, not, if we're not looking for them, we will miss serious injuries. Here is the same child that we saw with a flail chest who had a pneumomediastinum. And if we look more carefully, we can see that this child had a sternal fracture with a small fragment of bone that was impinging on the pericardium. And this is very important to identify. Now, let's talk a little bit about diaphragmatic injuries. These are also relatively uncommon, but very important to identify. The mechanisms of injury are almost always resulting from a motor vehicle accident and are caused by a change in pressure between, or a difference in pressure between the pleura and the peritoneum. A lateral impact has a three-time risk for rupture compared to an anteroposterior posterior um, impact, and I'll show you why in a second. Over 50% of the diaphragmatic injuries are on the left side and occur in a posterior lateral position and they are associated with abdominal injuries in about 75%. The key thing here is that the initial radiograph can be normal in up to 50% and the diagnosis delayed in almost 15%. So here is a, a graphic of the chest wall in a diaphragm and this animation shows the effect of a side injury. There is compression and distortion of the rib cage with a subsequent laceration in a, in a superior inferior um, pattern of that leaf of the diaphragm. What happens is that you have a diaphragm that's intact, 
there's a there's a difference in um, pressure resulting in herniation of um, abdominal viscera into the chest, and this manifests itself as an elevation of the that diaphragm. Now, although it could be seen with um, contusions or um, subpulmonic effusions, an elevated left hemidiaphragm um, is a key to further exploration of diaphragmatic injury. Here's a second child that has a CT showing a small amount of colon herniating through a much smaller diaphragmatic defect. Compare that to this child who was a 17-year-old involved in a very high-speed motor vehicle crash and you see complete opacification of the right hemithorax. What's missing is that there is no liver in the abdomen. The entire liver is herniated up into the right hemithorax. And on the axial views, we can see a flaccid leaf of the diaphragm with colon and, um, and other and mesentery above the diaphragm. So this was a complete tear of the right hemidiaphragm with herniation of the right, of the, of the liver into the right chest. Every once in a while, we will miss a diaphragmatic injury because uh, the child is on positive pressure ventilation. This was a young child who had been the victim of non-accidental trauma. And on CT, we knew that he had a hepatic laceration and hematoma. However, he was on positive pressure ventilation and could not come off the ventilator. And yet, despite um, looking like a pretty normal chest, there was a mild elevation of the right hemithorax, of the right hemidiaphragm, that we attributed to the underlying hematoma. But because of the difficulty in taking him off the ventilator, what we did was we took an x-ray off positive pressure and look at the difference. We see marked elevation of the right hemidiaphragm because the di diaphragm was being tented or stented by the positive pressure. So if you have a concerning uh, child, maybe uh, one of the things that you can do is to do a, a repeat chest x-ray off positive pressure. Well, what is the effect on on, of chest injury on children? Well, the mortality rate overall is high. It's up to 25%. But it, with isolated chest injury, it's much, much lower. So the excess mortality is often associated with multi-organ injury, chest and abdomen or chest and head. The injury type affects mortality as well. Heart and vascular injuries are obviously much higher mortality rate. Pneumo and hemothoraces um, are associated with a much higher mortality because of other underlying injuries and so forth. So I wanted to finish with a review of what the differences are between adults and children. Because the ribs are so compliant in children, the prevalence of rib fractures after blunt trauma is much lower in children than adults. However, because the lung is not as well protected, the prevalence of contusions is higher in children. And in comparison to adults, blunt injury is more common. In adults, both penetrating and blunt um, have a, a role. Flail chest as the result of these flexible ribs is uncommon. Um, the problem is that both the, the, the pediatric mediastinum is quite mobile, and so a relatively small tension pneumothorax can cause a um, great deal of motion in the, in the mediastinum and can, affect res and can cause respiratory compromise. And finally, vascular injuries are much less common in children. So the, the last things I wanted to leave you with, our conclusions, were that the emergency chest radiograph is really an insensitive tool for looking at all of the chest injuries in children. And CT can really be, do a great job in demonstrating the true extent of injury and the complications of therapy. And it may be quite useful in the early identification and management of life-threatening injuries. However, 
routine chest CT is simply not indicated in children. CT it can, should be used as a focused uh, injury-based um, imaging modality. Thank you.